Uh, we're basically talking about core stability, and today I was going to lead into rotational elements. Um, the most significant thing I talked about last time, we, you know, it's, just, it's great to see new faces in the group too, because the idea of these lectures is that we all speak the same language. There, you know, in the sports medicine field, which encompasses everything, soft tissue massage work, physical therapy, sports training, exercise physiology, etc. We should have a similar genre of terms we use. Now we can debate certain things, but there's certain things that are non-debatable and we should be speaking the same language. For example, when the spine collapses into flexion and rotation, there's high loads on the disc and the soft tissue structures. So we can debate the merits about positions we might use in yoga versus Pilates versus physical therapy, but we can't debate the physics of what happens at the spine. That terminology and the physics of that is the same regardless of what happens in training field, physical therapy field, Pilates. So we can speak the same language in terms of when we bend over with load and we twist and we have a weight, there is a rotational force that goes through the lumbar spine and the, the bulk of that is, is taken up by the disc. So last lecture, I started talking about the difference between, and I find this real fascinating, we talk about yoga, physical therapy, and what we're trying to do with reconditioning movement patterns is we have something called loaded movements, which is where you're actually picking things up, and then we have unloaded movements. Unloaded movements can be anything where you're on all fours and moving your spine like in a cat and camel. That's an unloaded movement. If you're picking up a weight and doing pulley stuff, that's a loaded movement. Now you get away with a lot more in terms of freedom of motion and margin of safety when it's an unloaded movement. We talked about the lumbar spine, and the lumbar spine isn't designed to twist and turn under load. Now I'm not saying the lumbar spine can never twist and turn. You get about 15 degrees total of motion, you know, two or three, two or three degrees from each lumbar segment. Compared to the thoracic spine, you get a dramatic dramatic increase in range of motion in the thoracic spine for rotation. So we want to put the emphasis on rotation in the thoracic spine. Doesn't mean the lumbar spine can never not rotate. And you see this when people are warming up, right? Sometimes we warm people up like this. Where's that rotation going? It, well, a lot of it is in the lumbar spine, in fact, doing this. You know, I am, this looks coming over, and you can see I'm twisting from the lower spine. I mean, the pelvis is coming around, and there's rotation through the lumbar spine. It's not a loaded movement, right? Now, depending on the person you talk to in our field, some people totally drop this exercise because they don't want to see any lumbar rotation occurring because the argument is the spine doesn't tolerate that rotation while at the lumbar joint. Versus this motion is, where is the motion emphasis here? Thoracic, it's up higher, it moves up the chain. And this is designed to rotate. This would be something golfers use, right? To get into that rotation of the upper body. Now, the way I, I personally take all that information is, what is the margin of safety? If I've got a 50 or 60 year old patient who's got a history of low back pain, the margin of safety is small. He's already done damage to his back, right? But this exercise is out. This exercise in the warm up is out. Things you would typically see, you know, people doing in a warm up because the margin of safety is low for people who have already injured their low backs. You have a 21 year old kid who's doing yoga or something and they've never hurt their back. You can get away with a little bit more dynamic exercises in the low back. So you have to kind of dictate what type of patient or client you have and where your margin of safety is as you're warming them up. The one thing we all agree on is where do you need motion? your hips and your shoulder girl. Everyone agrees we have to have mobility in the hips. We talked about this, the work of Sarman last lecture. If your hips aren't mobile in all planes of motion, particularly with rotation, when you try to rotate in standing, if your hips don't rotate well, where does that rotation come from? The lumbar spine. That's why golfers with bad hip rotation end up twisting their spine, and that twisting force results in, visualize a sponge here, compressive twisting force that shears at the sponge and rips the disc. That's why disc injuries are so common. It's also why this exercise isn't necessarily a good recommended exercise. Where's the rotational force in this exercise? Through the lumbar spine. It's in a sitting position, so you got weight going through the spine. So this exercise, margin of safety is low. 
So I personally don't do this one. If I want to stretch the hip though, what's the easy way to take the load off the spine and get the stretch on the hip? Drop back. So now you can get the stretch of the posterior capsule of the hip to improve hip mobility without putting a rotational torque through the lumbar spine. Does that make sense? So this is, these are things we talked about last time, getting range of motion in the hips, range of motion in the shoulder girdle and the thoracic spine, keeping the lumbar spine somewhat fairly stiff, though under certain conditions you can flex and extend the lumbar spine unloaded safely. But as you start applying load, you know, Imagine this being a 50 pound weight going over the head, like you would do, we do, you know, these in hit class or CrossFit. But you've got to be sure what, as you drive this weight down here, that you have the straight spine, right? And as you go overhead, because this is loaded, that you don't default into what? A hyperextended spine. Because of the crushing forces on the vertebrae. Now, in yoga or something where you're not using weight, can you go into a hyperextended spine a little bit? No wait, it's unloaded. How about side bend? You can put the side bend force through the lumbar spine. But again, should everyone be going to the extreme end range of motion in yoga or training or Pilates? Depends on the margin of safety. You get someone with a back problem, poor stability patterns, they can't do a plank well. You want them going to the extreme range of motion to even unload it margin of safety goes down. So you might only go half the distance. Make sense? So it really depends on your clientele. The challenge in group fitness is, how do you get, you know, it's hard to gauge. You got so many people moving, you don't know what their prior history is. That's the challenge in group fitness classes like HIT, you name it, a TRX, you know. So the cue I tend to use is, don't go the full range of motion, go half the distance. Don't try to make it a competition of who can side bend the furthest because you don't know who's got the stability, muscle firing patterns to do that, who's got prior damage in their spine, who doesn't, go half the distance, keep it straight. The other thing is under loaded movements, even with side bend, ideally we don't want a lot of motion in the lumbar spine. There's a big difference between working range of motion, side bending, and taking a loaded movement, which should be a stiff lumbar spine, and the axis should be where? The hips. These are things we got into last session. Quick review on that. These are all in the video. Um, we talked about sit-ups and crunches, things like this. Well, first of all, what are the forces, when we talk about forces going through the spine, we're talking about gravity, right, which creates an axial compression. But the majority of force that creates compression actually is not gravity. What do you think it is? What creates the greatest compressive force driving these vertebrae together, smashing them like your muscular system, your muscular system. So just visualize my paraspinal muscles running through here and they're running north south. So right now I've got gravity compressing the spine together, which is somewhat stabilized. As soon as I start to bend forward, what starts to fire the force? My erector muscles running north south. Now when they fire, they have muscles to create contractile force. So they're actually pushing my vertebrae together. They're, they're stabilizing, but they're contracting with a great deal of force. As I put weight in my hand, visualize 100 pounds, they contract with much greater force. The same with your abdominals pulling this way, the same with your lats, your muscles can increase these high compressive forces. So by virtue of physics and angles, picking up a 100 pound weight out in front of you correlates with over 1,000 pounds compression going through the lumbar spine. Quite a bit. You just, you know, it's just physics and lever arms. But your muscles are what are creating these high compressive forces. So we have to keep that in mind when we're loading people with weight and some of the physics there. So a sit-up, for example, we talked about when we were doing sit-ups and rounding the back. It's one thing to do a sit rounding the back to try to create motion in the lumbar spine unloaded. But if I try to do a sit-up like this, rounding the back and going down segment by segment, there is a mobility issue getting right. However, as soon as I fall out of neutral and I do this, there's a compressive force occurring as well. Does that make sense? So this is the danger in trying to do sit-ups too high with a rounded spine versus watch gymnasts do sit-ups. What do they do? They come into thoracic extension, they set their core, they come up with a straight spine. You ever see them do pikes? 
they're like this. You'll never see them really rounding like this very often. They do the iron cross, they set the core. Everything is very rigid here because there's more power and then they don't default the spine into a pelvic tilt under load. You know, watch them. Everything stays very rigid for the low spine in gymnastics. And they do that to maintain power so they don't default in positions under load. Okay. Questions on any of that? Okay. So today we were going to talk a little bit about rotation. And the significance of rotation is most back injuries, most issues with performance, they stem from an inability to rotate properly. The most important thing to think about when you rotate is if someone has a rotational flaw, it's not any one muscle group, it's the pattern is flawed. So when I rotate with force, whether I'm using a rip trainer or a medicine ball, you know, there's a pattern we're trying to create. No one muscle group will contribute any more than 30% to that pattern, which means we're trying to create a symphony of muscle firing patterns to all work together. Now, if we have one muscle that doesn't show up, let's say the erector, you can try to strengthen it by doing erector exercises, um, you know, with things like this. However, unless you put the muscle into the pattern, the muscle firing pattern, it doesn't work. And this is what we're going to let you guys demonstrate today, how you go through a process of strengthening rotation. But rotation gets the greatest co-contraction of any exercise. As soon as I apply a rotational force and I hold this here, I've got muscle firing patterns of abdominals, all three layers, internal, external obliques, erector, the deep layer of the erector, the lats, everything kicks in. So if you wanted to strengthen core, rotation is the way to do it. But we have to be able to control rotation before we can produce rotation. Producing rotation is a very delicate pattern. And if it's flawed, you're gonna create a lot of back problems because with all those muscles firing, there's high compressive load. And if the movement sequence is off, you'll default somewhere. You see it all the time. People default, they go into extension, they go into flexion, the tennis serve, they go into hyperextension. The, the pattern has to be very delicate. And you know, our job as trainers and PTs and, is to groove that pattern so it transfers over into everything in daily life. That we teach people not to hyperextend, and then eventually you do it with what? Speed, load, endurance, where they breathe heavy just raise all the parameters up. So let's go through, that sounds like a lot, and you're like, well, where do we begin? That's what, kind of what I want to try to go through today. So what are the phases you go through when we're trying to develop good core stability slash rotational strength? Okay. So phase one, you've got to have mobility, right? So if people lack mobility in their hips or shoulder girl, you've got a problem because we can't produce rotational strength if you lack mobility. And this is where we all work together as a unit. If I see someone where I've got to build up rotational strength and they lack shoulder motion, I can send them into the therapist to get mobilization so they achieve full shoulder motion. I can send them into the massage therapist so you guys can work on the pec, loosening up all this tissue here that's pulling them forward because they can't rotate well if they're in a, in a position like this or if their hip flexors are so tight that it's pulling their pelvis like this. So this is where we all work together. We say, okay, therapist, you loosen up the psoas, tissue work, physical therapist, you give them exercises to lengthen the psoas, trainer, groove that pattern. Okay? Everyone works together and trying to create alignment before we start producing patterns. We have to have alignment first. So we need mobility in the hips, we need mobility in the shoulder girdle. So exercises, once, you know, some people can't do these exercises, why? Because they don't have the mobility to. So we've got to give them progressions to get the thoracic spine back. We've got to give them progressions to get hip extension. And combine that with tissue work, combine that with mobilization work. Make sense? We've got to give them rotation in the hips so they can rotate the hips freely into internal rotation. Thoracic spine mobilization work, you know, where the T spine is loosened up. So it all begins with mobility because if we can't get them upright and tall, we shouldn't be patterning the motion. Make sense? Then we've got to start to create basic stability patterns. This is part of the last lecture, right? And this is where too often, in, I think in our field, we try to teach stability while people are moving. And that be, you know, we're saying, okay, set your core, okay, now jump. Or set your core, now pick a weight up. That's kind of like trying to teach a two-year-old how to bicycle before they can walk. You gotta get them on the floor. 
And remember we did this last session, you gotta teach them how to brace, create midline stabilization where their pelvis isn't a buckle, doing things like this. They've gotta learn to stabilize and just tighten their core and then progress with single joint motion. Single joint motion and then combination patterns, the basic dying bugs, this stuff. Then the bridge, bracing. Everyone, you have to devote 10, 15 minutes of your session to this with most people. I mean, most people need 10 to 15 minutes of this in the hour session. You got your hour session with your client, you got to figure out when to get this in because you can't create good midline stabilization and standing with advanced activities if they don't have the basics on their back. And then, of course, that leads into, you know, quadruped. Can they brace and maintain stability? Can they brace and maintain stability doing the basic stuff like this? Not just a warm up doing this. It's got to be real detailed. They can't do this well without defaulting into a twist or a rotation for height. There's no way they can maintain stability with a medicine ball smashing it into a wall. It's just not gonna happen. So we've gotta have this basic stabilization, then the dynamic stability, and then it's gotta transfer into standing where everyone learns how to stand with the external rotation. This was one of our lectures, external rotation. Hold this posture, and then the single joint rule applies again. And they do basic things like this while maintaining stability stability. Then the basic patterns of hip hinging while this doesn't move. Bracing. These are all blueprints they have to have. Make sense? Okay. There's, and again, this is combined with tissue work, stretching, to give them this freedom of motion to move freely with the neutral spine. Then we can start some of the basics of rotational control. Now, I talked about last lecture, you have to have control before you have production of so with rotation, we can't have people throwing the ball like this or swinging the rip with until they can control rotation. So let's have everyone go into the, this position right here, quadruped. Everyone follow me so far? Basic stuff? Okay, so right here, if you just brace your core, tighten it, and you pick one hand up like this, that's, a, that's where some people start. You just have to control rotation, the most basic element can you pick up and not twist or turn your spine? Okay. Then we can go into the push-up position. Spread the legs a little bit. Push into the floor. Really engage your lats. Push hard. Okay. Then pick one hand up. Go to the opposite shoulder. Opposite shoulder. Feel that rotational force coming through them? Everyone should be able to do these basic rotational control exercises without twisting or turning the spine before more advanced standing exercises are proceeded. If you see someone do this and this happens, this, or after two reps, they start to default or turn or fall over, they're not ready for advanced rotational exercises in standing. Yeah, you gotta get these basics. And everyone should be able to do a good bird dog move. Just try this one right here. Now, if you hold this for 10 seconds and you do it right, and you really push that other, the stance arm into the ground, drive that arm in. Feel that lat engage. Okay. Now you can try patterns. Take it out. Watch the square. Drop it to the floor. Center it. Take it up again. Go through that square without letting your back move. And see how much that burns in your spine. Now McGill recommends you take this hand out here, squeeze it, and visualize the force coming through your hand through your lat all the way down to the opposite side. So you're really stabilizing, pulling through. This should not just be a loosey-goosey. It's bam, lock that shoulder out. Feel the force going through the pelvis. Got it? That should be a very difficult exercise in terms of the contractile force. And that's the same force, the erector force, controlling rotation you're gonna to use to produce force, which we'll talk about in bump skiing and tennis and so forth. So you gotta have these basic fundamental movements down combined again with mobility exercises to create good alignment. Okay. Oh. Okay, mobility, dynamic dogs, um, quadruped, dog, eagle, like armless, standing, okay, standing at cable shops. We've got the cable machine here. So, if you can master these, you can do some in stand, uh, kneeling and standing. I showed these last time. I'm going to make it more advanced. 
difference. This is out of Mike Boyle's progression. So he takes him to half meal. Now the key strut system here is the rear glute. This glute's got to be tight. This is up. And you've got to be able to control rotation. There's no, no twisting in this position, the half meal. Just like a child learning to go from half meal. It's not a chopping pattern like this. It's neutral spine, chest up, this pattern. Make sense? Then in the standing, it's this pattern. And this one, Robin and Pam this morning. Bracing, pulling in. See it? There should be no motion and no default of the spine. When I come out here, if you see this from the side view, the bucket tipping out, it's too heavy of a weight. You gotta recondition that neutral spine. Go lighter. So that's the pattern. You gotta teach them to control rotation. Now again. What was what I said when the first lecture we talked about? What are we doing with the hips? External rotation. Why? Because your hip is more stable in external rotation. You take up the joint slack, the capsule slack, it locks the hip in, which helps you lock the back in. So what you see a lot of times is, and then the default, where? It's the default, and watch the neck default. So you've got to close down all these loose ends. Neck, lock it. Thoracic spine, lock it. Neutral spine, lock it. Hips, lock it, rip the floor. This is the pattern you're looking for. Make sense? That's how we begin to teach basic rotational control. But we start on the ground, and then we work our way up. Now you can even do manual therapy. Sarah, why don't you come up here? This would be one step below that. Just go on your knees for me, please. And this is something physical therapists are used to doing, but not so much the trainers, but manual therapy stuff. Don't need move you. Hold the shoulder forward. Forward, yep. Just stay tall. Stay tall. You don't need move you. Don't need move Oh, stay tall. Oh, that's yeah. Right. It's okay. Yeah, first time, this is cute. So I'm pushing her shoulder forward, driving her pelvis back. So she's just learning basic co-contractions of how to control rotation. This is a great way to teach rotational control. One hand around the front of the pelvis. I think it's such a good exercise. I'm gonna let you guys practice it on each other for a second. So one hand in the back of the pelvis, other hand in the front. What happens when I do that, Sarah? What do you feel engaged? Um, my glutes. Your glutes? What else? Yeah, my shut my thoracic. Thoracic, yeah. abdominals, everything. Yeah, it's basically, yeah. yeah. You get firing through here. Pair off a second. Try that. Go in kneeling. One hand around the pelvis. One hand around the shoulder. This teaches how you can develop rotational control very effectively. Well, the cue is hold, hold, hold. Hand comes around the front, other hand goes around. Watch my hands here. One hand's around the pelvis, one hand's around the back of the shoulder. Feel the pelvis right here. Get it lower, right above the AI at the front of the pelvis bone. Drop the hands down. Most of you guys are too high. Okay, get the other hand up high on the shoulder and push your hands together. Feel the force. You feel the erector fire. Now watch the hand switch. What? It comes around the front of the shoulder, back of the pelvis. Feel the reciprocal pattern. Reciprocal pattern. Reciprocal pattern. Try. Now watch, I'm going to speed it up. Don't we move you? Don't we move you? Don't we move you? Don't we move you? And then you do the other shoulder. Now, what does that teach? It teaches someone how to fire reciprocally, which is what happens when you ski, right? It's not just erector. It's constantly boom, 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 boom. You guys get it? A little bit? Okay. If anyone wants afterwards, that's it. Dirk's got it really good right here. And see, he's playing with tempo. He's boom, 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 boom. They're dancing. <laughs> these are great way. I'll, you know, I use these periodically to warm up clients. You know, manual therapy. It's a great. You know, I don't think we use manual therapy enough in the training room. It's a great way to get this reciprocal co-contraction firing pattern going. It's very easy to teach. Okay, so you can see that could be a progression: kneeling, then the half kneeling chop. You know, with the cables, then in the standing. We can use the rip trainer as well in standing to teach that same pattern, right? Same pattern, right? But you notice I'm not producing rotation, I'm controlling rotation. Now, the biggest, I think, I think technically where most injuries occur with rotation and standing 
is the erector, the lack of the erector contribution, meaning your skiing bumps are coming down the fall line, you hit board, and there's a momentary lack of firing of the erector muscle group, which is key to control rotation. The erector probably is the biggest contributor to control rotation than any muscle group. So if the erector doesn't fire well, there's a momentary lapse where the vertebrae isn't supported. And when that vertebrae loses, oops, I just dislocated his spine. <laughs> Uh-oh, okay. When there's a momentary lapse of control in the vertebrae, visualize you're coming down, you hit the bump, right? Bam! What happens to that vertebrae? Let's just use these two as an example. When there's a momentary lapse in the force vectors this way, right? I hit the bump, boop, I get thrown forward. And there's usually a rotational element with that, right? It's usually not perfectly centered. There's a twisting force. If that erector fires late, remember I used the harness example last time? The harness, the erector comes in at an angle like this. If you're in neutral, if you're not in neutral, it comes in like this. And it's gonna pull back this way. What happens if, if it's delayed or it's weak in its firing pattern? What happens to this vertebrae relative to the vertebrae below it? Which, rec, which way is it gonna go? It's gonna go forward and it's gonna come in and it's gonna twist at an angle. Now, if you see this disc right here, if something comes forward ballistically and twists, what do you think it's gonna to do to that disc structure? It's gonna shear it. Take a sponge, compress it, because as soon as you go forward, there's, the erector is gonna fire, right? Which is gonna squish it, and then shear it like this. What happens to the outer red end, ends of the sponge? They start to shred. Do that a few thousand times, and keep turning that erector off, because of poor muscle firing patterns, they're not training it properly, and then you start walking in the clinic with back pain, because you don't have rotational control with the erector, that forward flexion thrust. So you gotta retrain the erector to fire with rotational. That's where we pattern. But as I mentioned earlier, you can't just get the erector, you could do back extensions all day and see the machines. You've gotta put it into a rotational pattern. So isometrically, what's a great exercise to do that with? Is start to get the erector to fire isometrically and have a rotational force on it. 10 second holds isometrically. And then I can add vector right here, okay? Just isometric. Okay. Now, where's most of the force in the erector? It's when I'm up right here, right? Because I won't get any force down here. So I've got to mix this exercise in with other exercises where the force is, you guys follow me here? Right now, where's the greatest amount of force? When I'm upright or bent over? Upright. Now, when I'm skiing bumps and I get thrown forward, where am I breaking down? When I'm upright or when I'm forward? So I've got to retrain the erector to fire in this position, not just this position. This position will help my erector get stronger when I'm doing activities like what? Sprinting, skipping. So I can get good stability, rotational control around my core with sprinting by strengthening up here. Inevitably though, I've got to do something where I create rotational strength in a flex position. What's an easy solution to do that? Change my posture. Now I'm in a hip flexion position. See the difference? Same exercise, but now I'm strengthening my erector in a flex position. And I can do it sitting on a ball. So this is where some variation come, come in. Simply changing your posture. See, now I'm seated. This is a completely different load on the erector versus when I'm standing up straight. One is a flexion position, one is an extension position. So I would recommend start doing the pitchfork exercise or the isometric exercise in sitting or long sitting so that the, you're in a 90 degree flexion angle versus doing it in an upright standing position. Make sense? Yeah. Now how's the other way I can load the erector in flexion to mimic that force? I have to get over angles. So right now here, I'm gonna to try to maintain neutral, and this is, you know, right about there is maximum resistance, okay? So I'm at a, what type of, maybe a 30, 45 degree angle? This is very close to the angle. I'd great, it'd be better if someone were holding my feet down or, or locked in, but you get the point. This is a pretty good angle where I get good contraction through my erector, but I'm, it's, there's no rotational force. So this angle here kind of meets this angle here where I'm skiing, where most of the time I default into a rotational torque. So this is a good angle to strengthen the erector in. But what do I need? I need a dumbbell or something, right? 
Now I've got a rotational force. So visualize the machine downstairs um, and visualize how you can put people on angles, you know, with a 45 degree angle. And then a dumbbell, now I've got a rotational force twisting me, but I can fight it while I'm working the erector contraction. See that? I'm not hyperextending the spine up here. Max contraction is going to be right here. And then I can apply a rotational force. Strengthen the spine. Does that make sense? Just by changing angles, you can change the way you load. Now patterning it, was there a question with that? Patterning it, watch this. Where's max resistance here now? Do I have any muscle contraction with the ball over my head? Not really, it's pretty straight, right? What happens if I start to go forward? There's a contraction force, right? So right here, I can groove the hip hinge while I'm getting a nice firing pattern of my erector and glutes. If I want to add a rotational pattern, what do I do? Change the vector. This is very similar to what happens when you ski bumps. You hit the bump, there's the torque. You gotta groove this pattern where you don't do what? Twist the spine, where everything stays straight. Make sense? Now, of course, you would do this first without a ball because you've gotta pattern this. See it? Straight hinge into straight hinge with a little rotation. See how I turned the torso? These gotta be patterned with no resistance then you can start adding resistance. But what do we usually do? We get people loaded too quickly. You know, one minute of this, they, they've never been patterned, they've never gone through the basics of how to learn how to hold neutral spine, so they can't maintain midline stabilization. Within 10, 15 seconds, they default into what? The rounded twist, the knees buckle. We've got to pattern everything before we have them loaded high speed like this. Make sense? Okay. Here's another patterning drill for rotation. This is McGill's. Everyone, drop down here. Now, when you turn, I want you to try to get in a nice plank and see if you can turn as a unit without letting your upper body lead or letting your lower body lead. Watch the lower body lead. See the pelvis turn? Now watch the upper body lead. Now watch them go together. I lock the core, I pivot on my feet, and I come down. See if you can turn as a unit to the side, pivot on your feet. Your feet should be about 12 inches apart, one of you or two wide. That's it, bring the arm all the way up to the, there he is. And pivot all the way to the side of your feet if you can. And that's it, turn side to side. You're looking for that completely straight spine before you pivot as a unit. See, everything turns as a unit. There's no twisting in the spine. See this? It shouldn't be the pelvis turning and then the upper body. So you have to have a good plank first, which is why you gotta be able to plank first and do all this midline stabilization work. Then you turn as a unit. If that's too hard, you do have them do it on a bench where they're higher up. If that's too hard, you have them start against a wall Everything should turn as a unit. This is locked, this is locked. There should be no twisting with the upper body or the lower body leading. Everything turns as a unit. When they learn how to turn as a unit, then you can add, I kind of jumped ahead with this other stuff where you start adding things in like this, turning as a unit, or on the diagonal path at different angles. Okay? And the same with the, the rep trainer. This is why I love this one. This puts the erector into a rotational pattern. But they have to be able to maintain that neutral position. This is one of the best exercises to prevent the back from going out because you strengthen the erector in a rotational pattern. Then you can train them. See, the only, the only setback on this exercise is where's maximum resistance? Up here. We need something that gets the resistance down here. The risk of injury is higher, so how do we get around that? Switch the resistance. With the cable machine, because it's not an elastic band, I can still have quite a bit of resistance on the rotational plane. Simply, there it is. Right here. 
pitchforks. So now I've got pretty good resistance right here versus the, the pitchfork, I don't have any. So I've got a rotational force driving me down this way, trying to steer me into flexion and twisting, which is gonna destroy your spine. You've got a counter down. See the steer? Okay. That is a great exercise, but you gotta start light. You can even start with the medicine ball. You've gotta pattern that flexion and hip turn and get the erector firing. Make sense? Okay, that leads to the last topic, which is reactive training. Most of the time, people become unstable with rotation because the muscles don't fire quick enough. So we have to build reactivity. So reactivity is some of the things that you see us do in HIT class. The problem, again, even with HIT is it's a group class. Everyone's got their different degrees of spinal problems. Everyone has different stability patterns. We can't assess each person and know what their stabilization looks like or their endurance. But these are the exercises where how quickly can you get your core muscles to fire off and on? I'm gonna go on this wall right here. So now you're producing rotation on locks. Quick reaction, boom, because these are springs. Spring, spring. How, because most of the times when people get hurt with rotation injuries, their muscles fire late. So you've got to speed up the reaction process. Typically though, if people fatigue, what are you going to see happen here though? You're going to start over twisting. The load goes to the low back. Instead of staying up here, they're going to start flexing up. And the motion is this. That's the challenge. You know, and we do a good job, I think, in the hit classes of educating people about this. We do a great job of it. But it's still a challenge. You know, you got a lot of people going. It's the group fitness challenge. So I think the best way we can get around that is as many instructors to people ratios and just good explanations. And the other way around it is to probably possibly break down the time cycle. So instead of doing one minute like this, it becomes 10 seconds like that. Breathe, reset, think about it. 10 seconds. Breathe, reset, you make it into intervals. Explosive power with neuromuscular facilitation as opposed to a minute of just, does that make sense? And it's a completely different exercise and a completely different recruitment pattern when you do it that way. Okay. Now, here's another one I was playing with just in terms of the wall. We want to have reactivity to try to reproduce that force this way. I mean, it's all about changing vectors, right? This way the vector is this way. It's pure horizontal thrust. Very little, I mean there's a rector, but not to the degree if the force is like this, right? See the difference in the contraction force? So you can play with things like, and then eventually faster. That's not good, that's there, but you're looking for that quick recoil. Boom, 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 boom. Hip hinge, up. Throw, catch, throw, catch. We do it with part. Stand on the bench, your partner's will it, throw it, throw it back, throw it, throw it back, throw it. It could be done in the half mill position, right? Why do you like that? Just ideas to stimulate your thought. Just throw it over this shoulder on that vector for me. There's the contraction, quick impulse, neutral spine, that flexed, back, and then we can pick it up. Yeah, can it be, eventually it can be very fast force, but you see the quick impulse. That translates into impulse. Everything can translate into impulse and then changing the vectors. Now I put the bias on the front, right? All different vectors. That's how we have to strengthen rotation. But you can't just take a weak muscle and try to strengthen the muscle. You have to put the muscle into the pattern. That's the biggest thing I can tell you. So, quick review. It's a lot of material, I get it. Um, but we'll stay on this focus. On that note, this will lead into the next lecture because Pete Holman asked if he could speak. So Pete has been traveling all over the world doing RIP courses. So this would be a good feed in for RIP training. So Pete might do the March lecture in the fifth. And it'll be all RIP stuff. And you'll get Pete's enthusiasm and energy as he's 
whooping that cord all over the place, but it'd be a fun one for all of us to hear. So quick review. Everything begins, that's why the previous lecture is so important, because you can't rotational train until you can control midline stabilization. So there's no sense of doing any of this. If people can't maintain good stability on their supine and do single joint motions without defaulting into an arch or a flex position, don't even think of doing this other stuff because you're just going to destroy their spines. They have to have midline stabilization on their back, then, you know, and then all the other positions, quadruped, they have to have this basics. It's boring, tedious stuff. Well, maybe not if you're new in the field, but when you've been doing it almost 30 years, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've taught this, but the difference of teaching it with detail, push the hands in, set the core, external rotate the shoulders, brace, tuck the chin, kick out. You're never gonna stop teaching that. You know, I'm gonna be working with Jordan today at four. She's gonna do, I mean, she can't, then I can give her a little rotation, but she doesn't have midline stabilization down. So all I'm gonna do if I have her try to throw a medicine ball is default her into a position where her back's gonna hyperextend and create bad patterns. She's gotta get the midline stabilization down, especially as she's going into her growth spurt at 13, 14 years old. Otherwise, everything else is going to default. It's a bad position. She's going to have weak legs, weak shoulders. Um, Therapist-wise, diagnostically, every time I see a patient now, Achilles tendonitis, shoulder tendonitis, the first place I start with them, midline stabilization. I don't even look at the shoulder until I look at the back. Because if they can't maintain midline stabilization, I don't care how strong their rotator cuff is. They're going to default into a poor position if they can't stabilize the core. So first thing I do with all patients, regardless of the injury, even an elbow tendonitis, midline stabilization. Everything begins midline, flows outward. Um, and then, you know, you know, tissue work on the elbow, et cetera. But early on, midline stabilization begins. And to have good midline stabilization requires what as well? Mobility. You've got to have the hips mobile. Because if you can't get good mobility in the hips, in the shoulder girdle, you're gonna default into poor positions, you're gonna collapse. You need mobility to maintain these good postures and then to create rotational force with it afterwards. So we've gotta be able to create alignment. And that's the beauty of, that's why I'm glad you guys are all here. So when we refer a patient to massage therapy, and we say, you know, I'm trying to get this guy faster, but his posture's so bad because he's so tight in the pecs and his hips are so weak, he doesn't have hip mobility, break his capsule down, break his IT band, Give him some freedom of motion in here, put some slack into his joints so that I can work with him and stretch him, give him some mobility, and then I can use that mobility to create powerful motions. But there's no way I can create powerful motions if he's so tight he can't get down to the floor uh, or get the arm over the head. So that's where we all work together, whether it's a PT setting, a massage setting, a trainer setting. So we get that mobility, then we get basic stability patterns. Then we start grooving controlled rotational patterns. Then we start producing rotation in different planes. This way, pitchforks. This way, tennis serve. This way, we produce the rotation last. That's the last thing in the chain. Producing rotation is very dangerous if not done properly. You can do it until you can't do it. And you just break down. Eight up. Comments, questions. Please. Hernias, umbilical problems. Say, you know, I, again, uh, hernia is a little bit different because you got to be careful with the abdominal contraction. You know, so it depends on the degree of the hernia. If it's a severe hernia, they're going in for surgery. But a moderate hernia, same thing. They've got to develop midline stabilization. And it can actually be stabilizing for the hernia. If someone's got a small hernia, the abdominal contraction is stabilizing. If someone's got a big hernia, any contraction is going to rip the deep tissue out. So they've got to start with basic midline stabilization. They have to learn how to engage and brace their core, set their glutes, bridge. That's going to help their posture alignment and stabilize the hernia. What was the other? Uh, well, knee, knee issues. Same thing, midline stabilization. If someone has a knee issue, say for example, Let's say they have the most typical thing we probably see in the clinic, patellofemoral pain, or patellofemoral somewhere there. That means their kneecap is compressing into their femur groove with too much force. 
that usually means one of two things. One, they need to feed some slack into the knee joint. Their IT band, something is too tight, so they're moving around with tight blue jeans all the time, and it's driving the knee in here. So you need to feed flat slack in here. So we need tons of tissue work and tons of stretching to free all that tissue up. Then the therapist has to groove good stability patterns so they don't default into poor movements. So it's a combination of mobility, stability, but they can't move into good movement patterns if what? They break down in their core. Midline stabilization first, then hip stability. Second, you can work on mobility at any point right away. But that's the sequence. Is there to see the pattern? So that's where we work together. Therapists start working right away on strengthening the outer hips after, of course, midline, midline stabilization first. Outer hip strengthening, all the band stuff. While the massage therapists slash therapists are working on feeding slack into a tight joint or series of joints to free the body up so it can move into positions that free up all the joints. So we mitigate the forces on the joints to the body. Good question. Yeah, well it is, well in the sense that the martial artists understand the concepts of connecting the body. So they understand that if their job is to create force through a target, that the force is diminished as soon as you break the you know, basic rules. As soon as you collapse into four positions, you lose external rotation. You know, you collapse into internal, you lose power. So the end result is diminished. And then the load through the joint is diminished. So it's, it's performance based, but it's also rules of the the rules of the mechanics of how the body works, which is, begins with midline stabilization. Other questions? Okay, it's just about one. Um, so we'll continue on rotational training. Pete's just going to take you in through a series of high-end performance stuff. So it's important that when Pete gives you this next lecture, you remember what gets into these high end, I mean, Pete's gonna rip the hell out of that bar and show you some really high end. But you gotta remember to do that high end stuff safely and with control, you've gotta be able to do all this basic stuff first. It's a progression into the high speed power stuff. Yeah, I do have a question. Please. Uh, if you give someone a routine for the basics and they follow that routine on a regular basis, what's the timeline for your body to adapt and learn the midlife stabilization before progressing to yeah, so, okay, so you've got about five or six variables based on that, and it can be as quickly with some people as a couple weeks to two months to six months to a year. And the variables are obviously genetics, you know, I mean, you know, you're working with someone who's got gifted athleticism and knows their body well, or a motor moron, we call them, who you, you know, you just <laughs> keep putting their pelvis in the right position and they keep defaulting and you do it again. And you do. So that's one variable. Two is what is the amount of damage they've done to their body already? You know, I mean, have they created such bad blueprints? It, what's the expression? If you were going to teach someone to, to tango, it's easier to teach someone who's who's never done it before than someone who's been doing the steps the wrong way for 10 years. Because you got to retrain the whole blueprint all over again now. And every time you try to make them do one step, they do a different step. If, so if they have terrible ingrained movement patterns and muscle recruitment patterns, you've got to break them down. You got to strip them. You know, how, what is their mobility like? If they're tight, you know, and they've got no hip mobility, you gotta work spend, it could be six months till you put a dent in their mobility issues, but you gotta keep working on it, you know, over and over. So it could be two weeks, two months, or six months, somewhere in that range. But generally, I, the general rule I find with most of my clients, I can put a big dent in their movement patterns and get significant changes in them within a month, where they'll be like, whoa, I feel something. Something's happening, you know. And the funny thing is now, working with other professionals, I'm getting calls from the professionals working with them, like the acupuncturists are calling me saying, something is happening with her body that hasn't happened in a year, what are you doing? You know, the way the needles are going in, the tone, they're, they're reading the body differently. Um, so you're retraining the neurological pattern, the whole process, which is affecting what? Muscle tone. So you can have an, a dramatic increase in the tonal, the way the tone, the position simply by affecting alignment, which is a function of what? Mobility, stability, grooving good movement patterns. Have dramatic changes within a month. Okay guys, that's awesome. Thank you all for coming.